All right, and welcome. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. On the front end, I want to remind you, if you have questions or you'd like to engage in, in the panel discussion, you can add those questions or comments into the YouTube feed or into the church online feed, and we'll address those those questions or address maybe those comments if they're appropriate. Uh, right here in the context of what we're doing this evening, we want this to be interactive. Uh, we're looking at intentional practical, applicational discipleship, and which I think we, we really need a lot of in this day and age. Uh, we're going to jump into, there is a lot of content that I really want us to, to discuss and kind of cover this evening. For those of you who are kind of new to what we're doing here, we're going over Matthew chapter 5, the Beatitudes, which is um, kind of a very functional aspect of discipleship as defined by Christ mm -hmm. in, the, in the Sermon on the Mount. Beautiful. Beautiful teaching, uh, and we'll do that in the second segment. But I want to start out with uh, a scripture from Romans 16, 17, and 18, or 16, 17 through 18, and 2 Timothy 3, 13. The first one says, I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. Avoid them. For such people do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own appetites, and by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. This is huge. Very often we see what his word says, my people perish for, na for lack of knowledge. Na mm -hmm. Naivety is our enemy. <laughs> and, and Paul is really reiterating that. Now, he goes a little further. In the second pastoral epistle of Timothy, 2 Timothy 3, 13, it says, While evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Here's something that I think it's important for us to remember is the people who are operating in the greatest, dece the, the greatest um, level of deceiving others are often at the greatest level of self-deception. Being deceived mm -hmm. causes us to deceive other people, even if there's not intentionality associated with it. I, I said that because I wanted to jump into, into a, a kind of a, what I believe is a very relevant topic. It's kind of a backtrack to this weekend. And I'm going to make this statement, and this will be our, our jumping in point. If you are not committed to the narrative of the word, you will quickly find yourself ensnared by the narrative of the world. Again, if you are not committed to the narrative of the word, you will quickly find yourself ensnared by the narrative of the world. Dan, you spoke this weekend and you talked about the idea of a worldview. And you said something that I put in the notes here. I, I want you to say this because you said it beautifully, and I, I think it's so applicable to what we're going to be talking about this evening. Well, when it comes to worldview, a worldview, you know, we, it's not something you think about. A worldview is what you think with. Say that one more time. Worldview is not what you think about. It's what you think with. Hmm. And as we, as we develop this worldview, especially as we're trying to help develop a biblical worldview, it becomes the way that we see the world. I mean, worldview is exactly what it means. It's how we view the world. We view it through the lens of what we know to be true from the Word of God. It's not something we sit and dwell on all day long. You know, we don't, we don't have to, just to keep going back and, and revisiting all of these things, but it becomes part of who we are. Mm. You know, when that becomes your worldview, just like I, I said, it becomes what you think with. Yeah, you know, well, I have this phrase, you've heard me say it here in the context of, of the organization of the church, that there are times that we work on it. But generally, if we're not careful, we'll find ourselves working in yeah. it to the detriment of working on it. And we don't see change, we don't see progress and growth. The worldview is that essentially that, that working in it all the time. Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not something, but there are times when we have to be intentional about recognizing what may be detrimental about our worldview. It, it, it's like here, if, if we are busy working in Rockfish Church all the time and not actually assessing and looking at what we're doing it and why we're doing it and what we're accomplishing with it, we can find ourselves way down a road. Absolutely. Well, you used the word naivety a couple times there. And, you know, if we are so sheltered, I mean, we can do a lot of good things and we can do them bad. 
uh, uh, poorly. We do them poorly for those yes. who are correcting grammar as we go. <laughs> there we go. Yes. <laughs> but you know, we we stay inside. You know what? You know, people will say the Christian bubble. Not to uh, get off on the cliches here, but we stay inside that circle. If we're so busy answering the question that we don't find out what the question is, if we're so busy formulating our answers without understanding what the question is, we could miss it altogether because we are, we are naive to the point that we think we understand what people need without asking the people what they need, without addressing the real problems that are going on in the world around us. And that happens uh, all too often. Yeah. You know, you talking about worldview, you know, I've talked with people who say, well, I don't really have a worldview. <laughs> you know, well, you really do. Absolutely. Uh, we all have one. Yeah. Uh, and most of us don't realize how early in life that, that is formed. That's what's so dangerous. We, we think about it. That's why they want to, to push some, some of these issues into earlier and earlier years of education, you, you push it on children, issues of sexuality on children. Now, I know I'm old, but I'm old enough to rem I do remember when there was a time where we could all agree that you don't talk issues of sexuality with third graders. Right. Yet here we are now because the world understands that that, that worldview is, is formed typically by the age of 14. Right. Yeah. You know. There's some very crude sayings concerning that in certain, certain contexts. Um, you, you know, I think the big danger is, and I see this so often when I'm in counseling and I'm working with people, we want to change everything and we want everything to change except our perspective. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we hold our views because we think those views are correct and consistent with reality and consistent with the world. But very often we keep coming to erroneous conclusions or finding ourselves in, in a repetitive failures because we're thinking wrong. So how, how do you... How do you change that? You know, we, we talked about some of the components necessary for indoctrination. We believe in, in the context of Christianity that we're transformed by the renewing of our mind. Renewing mm -hmm. of your mind is that changing of the perspective through which you, again, analyze, decipher, or interpret the world. So as we look around, we are being indoctrinated, and our worldview, I believe, is being affected constantly. Paul, Paul said this statement. It said, above all else, guard your heart. And then he says, why? He says, from, for everything you do, all of your behavior, all of your decisions flow from your heart. When you look at what your heart is, your mind, your will, and your emotions, all of those are associated with a, a worldview that we're often not even aware of. So many times I see, I see people who are doing things and I look and I go, why do you keep doing that same thing over and over? They're, not, they're, they're in it. They're not working on it. That, mm -hmm. that worldview is just happening and it's just, well, it's just repetitive. And we've also got caught up, especially in the American cultural context of it's always somebody else's fault. Mm. Something bad yeah. happens in my life. It always has to be somebody else's fault. I'm and, a victim. And when, when, you, you know, when, when you take that mindset, then you never stop to look at yourself and your ways of thinking and, and your ways of acting. And, you know, I think we see that's one of the reasons we see the divorce rate as high as it is, because everything in a marriage, it's always your fault. Yeah. yeah. And, and the problem is then I don't ever change myself. And so if, if Jennifer and I were to no longer be married, and I never changed myself, then I find myself in a new relationship with the same old issues yeah. because it's the same old me. And that's why we see people, we see this thing because we, the, our worldview has, has been affected by the victim mentality that's so prevalent in our culture today. Mm -hmm. Blaming somebody. My, Kim and I have a, a, a something that we say that kind of is almost like something to kind of smack you in the head to remind you that you might be thinking through something wrong. Your response is your responsibility. I can't tell you how many times mm -hmm. people have said, you made me mad or you made me angry or you made me. First of all, nobody's going to make you do anything. We're all too selfish and, and self-willed to do that. But we respond in ways, and all of a sudden, what we're addressing is that 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 mentality, that victim mentality. Right, you because, didn't make me angry. The reality of it is, I had a disproportionate emotional response. I was angry and sinned when I knew I should be angry and sin not. But that was the thing. We look at it. Even if you did make me angry, I'm still responsible for what I did 
with that anger. Yeah. It's not just a matter of, oh, well, it's your fault that I did something stupid. Well, how does that connect into a worldview? Well, we got to get beyond the conversation. You know, we've got to, we've got to understand that we, the church, um, are complicit one way or the other. Mm. You know, how does it indoctrination work? It re works through repeated exposure to, mm. to an idea, to an ideology. Right. Um, we are charged with helping people form that biblical worldview. Right. So through repeated exposure, and that means we can't sit here and wait, you know, and open the doors on Sunday morning and open the doors on Wednesday night and people come in and, and then we uh, expose them to the idea of truth as we see in the Bible. It means we have got to be uh, very active in discipling and in, in mentoring and creating and living out relationships where we are able to breathe the truth in repeatedly. But this we're is the only we ones do it. doing it. But the church is the only one doing that, right? So we should have no competition. <laughs> no. Is, That'd that be that... great. That would be great if, if, if the church were the only one who were, who were breathing things into people's lives. Because like you said, you know, we see it in third grade. We see it in elementary school. Mm. We see it in media. We see it in television. There are people who are helping us form our worldview, whether we think we have a worldview or whether we don't. Exactly. Uh, yeah. 24 hours a day. Give us an example. Turn on the TV. Turn, turn on the TV. For just a moment. <laughs> and, you, and you are there. There, and, and there, there are people slipping ideas in all the time. So it know? is the major, um, what, what will we call it, uh, cultural indoctrination or cultural experimentation. We, we see it, we see how, and I was listening to, to a, a show that Alex McFarlane was doing recently, and he was talking about how the current administration, regardless, and when I say current, whatever administration it is that's current, in our military, basically the military begins to take on the ideology of right. that particular administration. It's almost like what we would refer to as social engineering. So there's a social engineering or a re-engineering of values that happens every time there's a new administration in the military. If you're in the military, I apologize. I'm so sorry, but you know, and I'm, I, I meet people all the time who are conflicted because they see a what they believe to be a biblically detrimental form of engineering going mm -hmm. on. So when we talk about social engineering, when we talk about discipleship that's actively happening, what is the terminology that I associate with that is it used to be called political correctness. It was politically correct. Uh, there's, there's the idea, there was a book called Live Not By Lies. Mm -hmm. Basically, mm -hmm. if you tolerate lies, you're basically perpetuating lies and untruths. Mm -hmm. The, the idea of the believer is when we come into contact with that social engineering, whether it's through the constant inundation of television or movies or music, to, to see those and offer a contrast to that very effective indoctrination. In fact, I'm going to say when we talk about indoctrination and development of worldviews and social engineering, that the, the church has fallen so far behind the creative ability and the effectiveness of the world to do that. What, what do you think? Well, I think there's so much homogenization going on. There, Ooh, big there, word. There, homogenization. there are so many blended ideas. You know, we use the word syncretism, syncretism this weekend when we were talking about these things. And there are so many ideas that, that are coming out from the church that as, as people are coming in, we're, we're preaching a gospel that's not a whole gospel too often. I say, I say we, I'm not talking about us three sitting at this table, although I have told my share of half-truths. You know, I've, I've been wrong before, right. but we, we see a lot of, a lot of um, untrue uh, things going out in the name of the gospel, and people are buying it because they don't understand the genuine. This is something else we talked about, understanding the genuine to the point that you recognize the counterfeit right away. That's huge. But if we are not giving the truth, if we are not continually, for lack of a better word, indoctrinating people, if we are not repeatedly exposing people to the truth, then when a half-truth or an untruth comes their way, they have no way to recognize that. There is, there is an onus on the church for us to be honest with what the gospel is, and it doesn't always feel good, and it isn't always good in the moment. But, but you said something, there's an onus on the church. Let's get back to who or what the church is. Okay. Because the church is not an organization. Correct. That onus doesn't rest on whoever's sitting at this table. There you go. And it rests on everyone that names the name of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. so we have a responsibility, a personal responsibility in that to, to know. You know, you can't come in and sit in church 
and expect that what you get on Sunday morning is enough to carry you to Wednesday night. That's powerful, but it's also detrimental. The reason I say that is I go back to what Paul said here. He said, I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create mm-hmm. obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you've been taught. And it's not just a matter of us communicating. Now it's a matter of how that communication is received through the prism of the, of the world view. See, everything that I say to you, everything that we're talking about, about right now is being filtered through a perspective. Mm-hmm. This is what, this is, this is that part, this is that metadata. When we, when we filter it wrong, we come to wrong conclusions and we live wrong from the top up to down. Mm-hmm. Paul is saying here, guys, you have got to be careful because if it's not unadulterated, if it's not clear, if it's not gospel doctrine that's coming out, then how it's lived out is going to be is going to be massively massively distorted, and that's Absolutely. what we're seeing. I, I gave an example of professing Christians in our culture, and I did this on on last Thursday. If y'all missed the the show we did last Thursday, please take a chance, take a minute to go back and look. But I talked about you made a statement, Dan, and I hate to regurgitate it, but I got to. It's so relevant. You made a statement that we as Christians can't stand here and shout at the darkness anymore. And I said, I said, man, that's true. But that's what worries me is that most of the Christians are so-called Christians or professing Christians because of the information we shared in re- week one, because of a failed image of how and who God really is, because of bad doctrine and bad world, mm-hmm. world view. A lot of most professing Christians are not shouting at the darkness. They're shouting at the Christians who are opposing the darkness, saying you should be ashamed of yourself. God is love and he would never rebuke. And he and all of this stuff. And I'm going, who is your pastor and where do I find him to correct him? (laughs) But we as pastors and we as teachers, all of what we teach and all of what we say is so incredibly subject to how you hear. The Bible says this, and Jesus said it this way. And it was so, it, I read it, and, and the revelation just blew up on the inside of me recently. He said, be careful how you hear. He didn't say what you hear. Hmm. You can't control what you hear. Hmm. But how you hear, if, you're he- if how you're hearing is correctly, in other words, if your perspective is in alignment with the, with the Spirit and the Word of God, then, then you will be able to correctly, correctly delineate between truth and a lie, between what's good, bad, evil, nefarious, whatever. But no matter what, it comes down to not what you hear to correctly put that thing in the perspective, but how you hear. And I believe that's why Jesus put such an emphasis on that. So what should we do when we come in, when we come into contact with, with, uh, teaching that we know is just a few degrees left of the truth. If we know it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, If we know the truth, but if we do know the truth, okay, you know, and, and we come across that teaching and it, it, somebody who comes in, you know, and you, you wondering who their pastor is because of what they're, they're spouting (laughs) off to you. Uh, what, what are we to do? Are Mm -hmm. we to just, just back up and quietly um, say that's wrong or are we to confront it? I mean, I, I believe that f- for us to do what we are supposed to do, and I mean we, the church, we, the Christians, we the, who call the name of Christ, we have got to be willing to engage. We, yeah. can't, we can't back away. Yeah. You know, we have got to insert truth where truth is missing. Right. And sometimes that is not well received. And in the name of political correctness, somebody just back away. Yeah. And they, they believe what you just said. You know, well, God would never. Yeah. And, and the balance to that is how we do it. Mm-hmm. The balance right. is how do we bring that correction? I remember dealing with it because the Bible is very clear. If you correct a fool, you invite a beating. So, so just so you know, somebody makes a foolish statement online or somebody makes a foolish <laughs> statement on Facebook and you correct that person, you're inviting a verbal beating. That's not my word. That, that's God's word. <laughs> and, uh, but it says if you correct a righteous person, they will learn and they will become even more. You correct a wise person, they become wiser still. But I think there is that, that responsibility for how we bring that correction. And I think very often we try to correct bad opinions with good opinions mm-hmm. when we need to point people to the word of God. And I'll give you an example and then we'll, we'll do a hard shift into the next segment. I really want to get into the, the, the beatitude that we're going to be talking about this evening. But I had a, there was a young lady and, and she had really, really just brought a scathing rebuke against something that somebody had said that was true. And I simply put, you know, please, consider, and I pasted a scripture. 
Mm-hmm. I literally just, I didn't, I didn't write the scripture out. I just put the first Corinthians, blah, 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 you know, in the text and where I really expected there to be a fight. There was not a fight. The word of God is powerful. The only way we're going to bring about a correct worldview is when people accept the true worldview, which only comes through the word of God, no substitute for it. It'll be accepted and received and lived or to be rejected. And, you know, I think sometimes we want to add more to that for whatever reason, sometimes our pride makes us want to be right in the argument. Uh, you know, what? sometimes we want to, we want to straighten somebody out and uh, we end up sinning, trying to bring somebody to a good conclusion. Any, any final thoughts on, on, on this aspect? Uh, this worldview thing fascinates me. No, I think, you know, uh, we, we have to learn and these other beatitudes leading up to this one, if, if we begin to embrace these principles for our life, we will know when to fight and when to quietly correct. I, th- I think you're right. I, I would challenge you, try this. Uh, most families have some television show, or maybe you and your spouse or somebody has a television show that you watch. The next time you watch it, watch it differently. Take a pen and a piece of paper and a pad of, pad of paper and a pen and pencil, or take, get something to write with. <laughs> get, yeah. And no watch it. apparatus. Ask God to help you spot the indoctrinational points. You will be amazed from the presence of that particular character representing that particular agenda to this, to that. It is so prevalent. My wife and I struggled for years to find anything that wasn't new age or, or uh, overtly politically correct for our children to mm-hmm. watch. And we were really, we really tried to watch that very, very carefully. Now, most of them, I think they can spot it. I think they can yeah. really, they can, but, but we had to train. We had to train ourselves. And there's a lot, guys, we just don't watch. We'll start a new series or we'll look at something and right off the bat, we'll see this agenda being shoved down our throat and we're not going to sit there and watch it and dull our souls and make ourselves receptive to, a, to something that we know is, that Christ died to deliver us from. And if, if we begin to make those choices, it'll begin to reflect in our culture. And, and just just be careful. The the world, the enemy, however you want to look, they love to use comedy. Oh yeah, as yeah. a way to bring down the defenses against these these things. Well, it's 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 just harmless fun. It's just funny. Yeah. But it, it's not funny. It's and it's it's detrimental and it's dangerous. And we when we think about it, and we don't think about it this way, but when we entertain ourselves with the things that put Christ on the cross, Mm. that's just a reality. You say, well, I don't think about it that way. That's exactly the point. We don't. That's a, it's a way of thinking. We look at it as entertainment. We look at it as, as whatever. Oh, or, hey, you're just religious. Yeah, I, I get that. I, I wish I were more religious. Anyway, hard shift, <laughs> Matthew 5, 7. Man, I have been waiting to talk about this one. I, mm-hmm. I really want to go over. We can't, but let's, let's jump into this one really deep. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Matthew 5 and 7. Mercy and the disciple, a place of prominence. Let's talk about it. Hmm. I, I just, you know, as I was looking at that scripture this, this morning and I went back and, and just looked at that word merciful in the original Greek to see what, you know, because we don't always get the, the full meaning out of the English word, but it, it carried this idea of active compassion. Mm. So it wasn't just, oh, I felt compassion towards them. It, it, it's active compassion. It's, it, that's amazing. So that brings up a point about mercy. Catch this. True mercy often costs you something to extend. Mm. D- did you hear that? True, godly mercy often costs you something to extend. It's to give somebody something for free that costs you something. And guys, that is a worldview that is counterintuitive to my flesh in every way, shape, or form. It so, is. I mean, we think of the Roman philosophers referred to mercy as the, the disease of the soul. Oof. Because that was not something that they saw as a, especially for, for the men, as, as a manly characteristic. Because it, mercy, the whole connotation of mercy was 
based on position of power, mm, right? Yeah. So yeah. It, it was, it was, mercy was me not giving you what you deserved when I had the power to do so. And I don't mean that in a positive way. It was usually mercy. We think about it and throw myself on the mercy of the court. You know, it, it's not getting the punishment you deserve when that person had the power to give that punishment. And so they looked at it as the, the, the disease of the soul. It costs us something to and be merciful. The very worldview of mercy before Christ had a direct association. This is why he was so revolutionary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mercy was another term for weakness before Christ. And he came and he transformed the worldview or the thinking of humanity. Remember the parable that he did. When I think of mercy, I can't, I can't disassociate this from the early years when, when I read the parable about the guy who owed a little bit and mm -hmm. the guy let him off and he went out or he owed a lot. And then the guy come and let him. And we yeah, very familiar with the, with the parable. And he said, you, he took him and demanded that he pay that little bit. And it really just flipped God upside down. And see, this is why you said the word revolutionary, and, and that's exactly what it was. That was such a revolutionary way of thinking as Jesus taught repeatedly about mercy and forgiveness and even told the Pharisees, go and find out what this means, talking about mercy. Mm -hmm. You know, it was so counter... It was so countercultural at the time because the Roman way of thinking had invaded the world in both figuratively and literally right. at that time. And so to forgive, to, to show weakness, like you said, you know, or to, for, to extend mercy was considered weakness. It was, it was a, a, a negative character trait. And, and what is the fear that we hear now? Okay. Let, let's just, let's go ahead and throw this out <laughs> on the table because here it goes. And you say, well, our culture doesn't see it that way. And we as Christians don't see it that way. Oh yeah, we, we, we do. Cause I can tell you when we think about extending mercy, which is giving grace and mercy to somebody who doesn't deserve it. You know what? The common, if I do that, I'll be a doormat. The, right. the self-perception right. and the self-preservation stops us from releasing what I believe is, and I touched on this right at the end of, of last week when we talked about it, what I believe is one of the most powerful spiritual weapons at our disposal. We hear about spiritual warfare, and we hear, hear about the weapons of our war, warfare. The power that mercy has to transform and to disarm I've got multiple examples, but I, I, can, I can think of several occasions where somebody harmed me. One particular occasion, I was, I was driving my car, and somebody come up, and, and they hit my car from behind. And I'll just tell you, you know what we think when somebody hits mm -hmm. you from behind. Cha-ching, yep. man, my back's hurting. Uh, you know, I'm out. I'm, I'm rolling around in the street, you know, because I'm thinking, my insurance, I'm about to get a new car. I'm about to get, you know, all kinds. Of, anyway, it's not, that's probably what the person was expecting because they were, they were mortified. And anybody knows me, I, I drive a beater, and that's why I drive a beater, uh, because I want to care more about people than my car. Anyway, <laughs> they hit it, I got out, and I looked, and this person was absolutely terrified. And I said, you know what? I said, it'll be all right. I said, I tell you what, if, if you want to if you want to call for your sake or your insurance, you know, you do whatever you need to do. Um, but as far as I'm concerned, I, I, I'm just going to give you a pass. And they were like, what? Mm -hmm. what, what, what mercy did at that point, and I'll just tell you with me how good it felt to give somebody something they didn't deserve. And what's running through my head the whole time is, you know what? God gave me something. I have rear-ended. I have trespassed. I've hurt people so many times, and God has, has given me the grace and the mercy that I didn't deserve. It was powerful. And to see how it affected this person. Think about it. It says it's the mercy of God that draws us to repentance, repentance, the goodness of God. We love him because he first loved us. Love is an expression or extension of mercy because like mercy, love will usually cost you something. And let, let's just think of how Jesus did what he did. You know, as he extended mercy to this to the sinful people, these people who thumbed their nose and even shouted at obscenities at God. We, like Jesus, have got to learn to separate um, or to recognize the fact that there is humanity behind actions. Mm. There is humanity behind an opinion we disagree with. There is humanity even behind someone who 
literally harms us. We've got to remember there are people behind that. And this is what Jesus was trying to teach us as he taught mercy and forgiveness and all these things. There is a human there. He understood it in a way we never will because he created. You know, he, he created man. He, he loved us beyond what we could possibly imagine and was so willing to extend mercy. And this is why he taught us in this way so that we would learn to do that. Mercy is a marker of maturity. Mm -hmm. You measure a person's maturity by the amount of mercy and grace that they walk in towards other people. It takes dying to your flesh. It takes suffering on our behalf to extend mercy to somebody else. Because again, mercy is something that is not often deserved and something that will often cost us something. Mercy is a marker of maturity. So either one of you have any mercy fails that you want to share? <laughs> that I want to share? Yeah, no. I wrote um, this in the notes. And there, Dan was like, oh, I really didn't understand what you meant by mercy fails. I said, have you seen fail army? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I've had some mercy fails. Anybody want to be transparent on some mercy fails? You chickens. Probably more yeah. than I yeah. care to yeah. mention. Well, I'm going to invite my wife up here, and she's going to, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. She's going to give you about 50 examples. Or That's, my children. Or uh, my children. Yeah. They can give you about 50 mercy fails. I think we would all freely admit there's more than we can. Absolutely. Yeah. There's been times when I knew that I should have extended mercy. So I'm going to give you a leadership point right now. I tell my leaders this always. Always start with mercy. Let me tell you why. Because you can always come back and drop the hammer, but you don't always get an opportunity to extend mercy on the mm. front. I will tell you this, you will never regret leading with mercy. Again, you can always drop the hammer, but you can't always have somebody in that position to be affected by the spiritual weapon or the spiritual force of mercy. Um, closing thoughts. If you want to discover the power of the word of God, if you want to discover uh, the power of Christ living in with you, um, learn to model uh, empathy and mercy and forgiveness in mm. your life. Mm. That's powerful. Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's key that the verse didn't stop with blessed are they who are merciful. It went on to say, for they shall receive mercy. Mm. Um, you know, and, and we could go on and on about what that means, but it's it's kind of like this idea that, that look, I can, only reason I can extend mercy is because of the mercy that God has extended to me. Mm, mm. And, and if I want to experience more of his mercy in my life, I need to give out more mercy to others. Yeah. You know, I, I, I really try, and stylistically when I communicate, I try to take things and condense them down into things that will shake people from their existing worldviews. So when it comes to mercy, if you struggle with mercy, like I have so many times, I'll say this, and I've used this and said this a lot. If you don't need it, then don't give it. Hmm. <laughs> Same thing with forgiveness. If you don't need it, don't give it. But I'm going to tell you right now, everybody in this room, everybody watching understands we need mercy. Mm -hmm. So we should give it in abundance. You, know, the, you were saying that my mind just went to the scripture. It's, it's often used to raise an offering. Oh, you know, get, get the buckets back. Give and it will be given back to you. Yeah. That, that scripture doesn't specify what? give money. Yeah. It, it, it just says give and it will be given back to you. Yeah, yeah. that's good. I want to I wanna flip. I want to show you a biblical example of what it looks like to, to face a worldview and flip it upside down with your life. I want you to go with me to, to the cross. When Christ was, was hanging on the cross and he's being mocked and people are saying, you know what? Bring yourself down. Get off there. It's now or never. Show up or show out or shut up. This is what they were saying. You said that you were this and you're that. Now here you are. Let's see you do something. And, and Christ's response, think of instead of that show of power that they were demanding for validation. His, Which he absolutely could have done. He could have, he could have done. His mm -hmm. lack of response to the mocking and the insults was the ultimate response of mercy. Think about it. 
You know, so often we're put in one of those positions where people are, are taunting us or, or demeaning us or insulting us and we want to respond with power to shut them up. In the movie, you know what would have happened? In the movie, Christ would, if, if this were Hollywood, at that <laughs> moment, he would have exploded and everybody's eyes would have melted, like in Raiders of the Lost Ark. Yeah. Have you seen that one? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it'd be like Raiders of the Lost Ark moment. Everybody's eyes would have melted and everybody in the theater would have went, yeah, they all got what they want. But that flipped the script. He flipped the script. And, and that's why he's worthy. That's why he's worthy to be praised and loved. All right. Thank you so much for being here. Um, do we get any questions? Mm, no not, questions. Not All right. Scene. Well, good. Maybe next time. Listen, thank you guys so much for being here. I'm going to pray and we'll get out of here. As always, if you need prayer, physical, emotional, mental, if you need anything, uh, we'll be here to pray with you. If you have any questions, we'd love to talk to you about that. Let's pray. Guys, thank you, Father, for your mercy. God, give us hearts that, that respond to different worldviews and different perspectives, even when they're detrimental to us and our existence. Give us the grace to respond with those or to those with mercy. And most of all, Father, please help us to be merciful for those of the household, those of the family of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.